Hello, I hope you're super excited. It's been a while since I've made a video, uh, but we got a really, really cool topic today. And we're going to be going over the sigmoid function. Now, this is something that you're going to be coming across uh, both as you, as you uh, get more into early intermediate machine learning where you start replacing act, um, layers in a neural network with activation functions and also the same ideas used in the sigmoid function you will actually see in a lot of deep learning networks etc if um, or you will see a lot of things inspired b or replacing the sigmoid function so this is definitely one of those ideas you really want to understand so in this video you will uh, by the end of this video you will have a very solid understanding of the sigmoid function what it's used or what its possible replacements are and the general idea behind them and how you could implement them in your own machine learning pipelines so just an overview a sigmoid function is a bit of a misnomer because what you actually refer to are uh, sigmoid functions are basically any kind of a function that has that s shape so what does the s shape mean in practice an s shape basically means that it's bounded on its range so for whatever no matter what input you your output will generally not cross a certain y value and that's what gives it the s here we can see that it it goes from one it's going to go all the way down then the minus one so uh, the logistic curve is a very good example because the logistic function which you know logistic regression originally created for binary classification is a perfect example of a sigmoid function you know uh, the hyperbolic tan function or the um, inverse tan function are both also examples of sigmoid functions you know you might be wondering why uh, this tan function shows up a lot so what's so special about these derivatives of tan functions and if you think about them uh, if you think about how your tan function is designed it is bounded between pi by 2 and negative pi by 2 correct and it it goes like this so things like the inverse tan which will just flip the domain and the range or uh, hyperbolic tan which is, is very similar to the tan function will obviously exhibit some of the, the properties now as mentioned what they can do is they you can feed them a very very large x value and they can kind of give you a relatively smaller y value and this might be important if you read my recent t tweet uh, series of tweets on normalization imagine we were working with house price detection and you're dealing with errors that are like in the hundreds of thousands and you don't really know how specifically to take that input and combine that with input that's like distances which you you know you don't want error more than 10 or maybe 20 kilometers in this case uh, the wildly different scales of these two dimension outputs can make it hard to work with so you could both feed you could feed both of their outputs into a logistic or some kind of a sigmoid function to squish the input normalize it between say 0 and 1 and then calculate error there and that will give you a very good understanding of how you're able to predict different important facets and how you might want to build your model and how you might want to build your pipeline to accommodate different predictions. So now that we've talked about that, wh why would we use a sigmoid and when would we use it? So anytime we're squishing input, sigmoids can be a very, very useful function. So we see them being used in activation functions. If you know the basic concept behind an activation function, we basically, um, have a function that get, uh, gets activated when you pass a th certain threshold. Sigmoids can do that. Um, you can you can squish input into the threshold, see if that matches that condition. Or as mentioned earlier, if we were to constrict, uh, if we were to restrict our sigmoid function range to something like zero and one, between zero and one, then uh, you know you can very easily see that this is the similar to probability. So. You could possibly take, uh, create a sigmoid function that will uh, basically take your input and output them as probabilities relative to each other. And this is, if you're working with this kind of a thing, in general, is just a much more intuitive understanding. You know, humans are terrible with actually understanding very high, le high value conceptual data. So being able to input them as probabilities will definitely go a long way in helping you un understand your actual performance and understand the next steps so obviously uh, i mentioned this earlier but logistic regression uh, kind of the 
uh, it's kind of the entry point to, uh, to a lot of people sigmoid functions i see if you actually google some videos online and they s claim they're teaching you about sigmoid functions they actually teach you about the logistic function because very often these are used synonymously and even the example i give you here is the of the logistic function so these are some of the common sigmoid functions and you see them being uh, constricted in different ranges as mentioned earlier functions of tan will show up very frequently you might see that you know we have the derivative of a tan uh, octan we have the um, we have a phase shifted tan function we have the hyperbolic tan function we have a lot of different of these and that is again going back think think back to what uh, the domain and range of a tan function is and it will make sense why these particular variants I have the shape that they do. So now, when we are actually dealing with this sigmoid function, oh, we need to know a few things. So, since uh, again, we've I've kind of harped upon this, but when you really think about it, what happens when your value is converging to a limit? That means your derivative is actually converging to zero. Remember, what does your derivative tell you? The der derivative of your function tells you the rate of change. So if I say that my value is converging to a specific constant then I also know that my rate of change is slowing down and that's kind of a problem uh, that is kind of a that can lead to problems now sigmoid functions why they were created was specifically because if you can squish the output it makes much more sense we don't always have exponential growth we might have exponential growth and then it tapers off because of real life constraints etc so sigmoid functions were created as a kind of uh, taking inspiration from these but uh, for example the spread of a virus is often of a very deadly virus is often actually sigmoid not exponential in nature because after a while the virus will start killing a lot of people so it's actually going to slow down that is what happened with the black death where uh, the virus actually stopped because uh, europe had no way to deal with it so it just killed too many people and that's a very common that is a very common this thing in a lot of problems where we have external constraints on the growth. So a sigmoid function or any function with a convergence to a constant will model that very well. But on the flip side, what happens when we use a sigmoid function in very deep neural networks? We, we will have the vanishing gradient problem. If you guys remember what this is, I brought this up in another one of my videos. Be sure to check those out. But what the vanishing gradient is, is essentially when we have very deep neural networks and we get a derivative of less than zero, w uh, so less than one, what tends to happen is as we go through the layers and as we backpropagate, et cetera, as we add more derivatives, your, your, uh, the value gets very, very small very, very quickly. So this can actually lead to a situation where your um, gradient just vanishes and then your, then your model is left with nothing to learn with which is why we often have a little bit of dropout included, which is why we have input, we have some additional inputs at mid layer, mid layers to kind of combat the vanishing gradient. Uh, this is, it's kind of the inverse side to the, what do you say, the exploding gradient, which is where your gradient might get so large that your network just doesn't, can't handle it very well. We also interestingly have the zero gradient problem which is all, which you will actually which is also some times you see an issue with this and I'll actually talk more about this as I talk about the relu but you know so it just seems like when in any time you have a neural network all kinds of gradients cause issues which is why you should be watching my videos so that you can learn how to deal with them so make sure you're subscribed to my channel to not miss out on other such great concepts now we have our gradient as its our derivative is coming to zero so our learning rate is converging to zero so this can make your training very slow and this is why we will often see um which is why more recent networks have started replacing a sigmoid with a relu relu is just a activation function rectified linear unit and it's a pretty simple function it just says you pick e either zero you pick the maximum between your zero or your input so in practice, it would look like this. And it's it's also being kind of modeled by, it's also being inspired by biology. If you guys know the idea of an activation function, activation threshold in a 
in the physical sciences you know you need to have a certain amount of energy to trigger actions i believe uh, i think we studied this in chemistry although don't quote me on this cuz my chemistry is famously terrible but if you you need to have a photon of a certain energy to release particles uh, if you just feed me 100 protons or photons of like very bad energy it's not going to work but if you feed me one good photon which might cumulatively have less energy than the 100 photons but it acti- passes that activation energy threshold it will actually trigger that reaction or a particle emission so it's this kind of similar where you see for all the negative values we're actually not going to activate and we're going to activate at zero and the benefits of this is one this is supposed to be closer to biology two is just really simple so it's easy to calculate three as mentioned we, you know our gradient is always one so we bo- we won't have the vanishing gradient or the learning rate slow down and what i mentioned uh, in the last slide which was the zero gradient problem you might c- come across it in this case because remember for negative inputs we're going to get return zero so you can you can kind of counteract this by adding a slight bi- positive bias and that positive bias will make sure that you don't uh, have a gradient of zero ever until you're finally ready to slow down so and you can always tweak the remember these these things aren't set in stone they weren't given to us by god you know we humans kind of improvise these over time so you can always tweak the basic functionality of your relu function you can you can change the lower bound on it you can add some kind of uh, another convolution or another kind of a function to the relu to make uh, to accommodate your specific needs remember machine learning a lot of it is about trial and error you're seeing uh, trying to you know we're actually what we often do is we just look at okay this is how it's performing what if i were to try these two three different things and one of them will work out so that uh, which is uh, you know one of the reasons why i uh, have that machine learning techniques playlist because you often see people coming up with very u- innovative ways to use already set ideas so be sure to check out my machine learning uh, techniques playlist if you want to understand different ideas of machine learning etc and while you're on that be sure you've left a like button on this video so th- uh, to help the youtube algorithm know that we're an amazing channel uh but that's it about the relu as you can see it's it, it, since it's simple it can be tweaked very easily and that's always one big positive for me which is that i always prefer simplicity because you should always try the simple things first there's a bit of a trend to run towards very complex very uh you know deep networks with lots of very complex functions and fancy things and that's fine they have shown bit to work but often you know simple things will work very well in practice so that's about it for this video thanks for watching again be sure you've liked subscribe um let me know what you want me to make a video on next leave that in the comment section below check out my um articles on medium that's where i break down a lot of the papers that's where i share a lot of the more in-depth analysis of different ideas and concepts my youtube is all you know i'm always working on youtube we crossed 100 subscribers recently so we i appreciate your support there we'll keep, we're going to keep going and if you have any ideas any thoughts any concepts you could also reach out to me on either linkedin instagram or twitter i'm always open to hearing you guys talk, discussing with you guys one of the best ways for me to learn and grow as a content creator and to don't what topics i want to get into next is basically input from you guys we've had some great discussions so far finally if you do like uh, if you do if you are preparing for technical interviews etc check out my substack uh, sign up there that's where i uh, both give the questions and break down the answers to many coding interview questions it seem to have it seems to have helped a lot of people so you know check that out let, let me know what you think and If you do like this content and would like to support me, make sure you use my free Robinhood referral link. I say this always, but it's free money, man. Uh, there's you're literally losing out money by not doing it. There's no risk to you. They don't expect you to put l- uh, money on your end. Just sign up for the account using my link and we both get a free stock. So, really no reason to not do it. That's about it. Thanks for watching. Have a good one.